Yes, hi, my name is Julie Bollinger. I am with the Berman Institute of Bioethics at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. I am a genetic counselor by training and a genetic research analyst in my current position. So what I am presenting on here today is a, um, some re results of a study that we are conducting that is following up with individuals who received pre-symptomatic genetic testing for Huntington's disease between 20 and 30 years ago at this point. So Johns Hopkins was one of the first two centers that offered this testing to folks pre-symptomatically, and um, we have contacted many of those original participants and asked if we could speak to them about their experiences with pre-symptomatic genetic testing, how they've used this information, what was helpful, what was not, and also to ask their opinions about some current policy issues that are facing the genetic testing community today, particularly around the issues of incidental findings from clinical sequencing. Uh, we were comparing the opinions of the folks. Uh, we gave them two scenarios, one in which an uh, individual has gone in for clinical sequencing for an unrelated condition, say for a hereditary cancer risk, and um, to figure out if that might be, you know, if genetic sequencing would be helpful for their treatment. But in the process of having all that sequencing done, they also found an expanded repeat for Huntington's disease, which means that they would be at risk for developing Huntington's disease. So we asked those folks in that scenario, would they, do they think people should be told that information? Should they be told their Huntington's disease status, even though that wasn't their original indication for testing? And what we found was that most folks thought that that was very important information to be returned. Um, overwhelmingly, about 90% thought that should be returned, but a portion of those thought that it should be asked before just return. And the other question scenario we presented to them was, what if we found not a Huntington's disease um, example, but something for a treatable serious condition, like a risk for heart disease? And the difference between those two examples is Huntington's is non-treatable, devastating neurologic disorder that leads to premature death. So we wanted to reverse that situation and present something that could be manageable or treatable. And did their opinions change in that instance? And in those cases, people had a higher, um, slightly higher, instead of 90% overwhelmingly, they were 90, closer to 95% that those sh thought those results should be returned to folks, and majority thought they should not be returned without even asking them, that they should just be given that information. So what we find that's important about this information is, first of all, we are following up with folks 20 to 25, 30 years later. So they have, a, these are the, the experts in how they've used this information, how they've lived their life with this information and what was helpful. Um, and we wanted to see and collect their opinions to help inform some of the policy debate about what are the recommendations now for returning incidental findings in genetic testing because the American College of Medical Genetics recommends um, findings for 59 different diseases and associated conditions should be returned. And we wanted to see if our population's beliefs fell in line with those, and they did. So that was very, very reassuring. But we wanted to point out that 5% of our folks um, that we spoke with did not think that Huntington's disease interzental finding allele should be returned at all. So that's not consistent with the current guideline. So even though overwhelming people support that guideline, the fact that 5% said under no circumstances should you return an incidental finding for Huntington's disease lets us, underscores the point of it's not a one blanket policy for everybody. There are going to be some exceptions of some people who do actively do not want this information. In the clinical literature currently, majority of folks don't want to get testing at this point in time in terms of the numbers who are at risk for Huntington's disease. And the folks that were in this study were at 50% risk for it because uh, they had an affected parent. Um, we also have a biased sample. So these are the early adopters. These are people who sought out the first pre-symptomatic test 25 to 30 years ago. So you're already dealing with a skewed population that were motivated enough to f come to the study and to pursue testing. Not everybody went all the way through for disclosure, and we were trying to talk with those folks as well. Mind you, it's hard to track folks down 25 to 30 years ago. Um, but, what, but what, to your point about, you know, we already have a more um, active group to begin with. So I don't think that our findings are generalizable at this point. I think that just should be, I mean, I think we can learn a lot from this population of people we've talked to, but 
they're a very unique group. So we can learn from them, but we also need to keep in mind some of the limitations. And our research would absolutely not have been possible without the overwhelming help and support from the people we've talked to who are in this original study, who are kind enough to open themselves to us again and allow us to speak with them about their experience. So we are, our team is extremely grateful to those folks.